unto you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. The sacrament of baptism will now take place. Please be seated. We read in the heavenly doctrine, baptism was instituted to be a sign that a man is of the church and as a reminder that he is to be regenerated. For the washing of baptism is nothing else than spiritual washing, which is regeneration. All regeneration is accomplished by the Lord through the truths of faith and a life according to them. Baptism therefore testifies that the man is of the church and that he can be regenerated. For in the church, the Lord is acknowledged who alone regenerates and there also is the word which contains the truths of faith by which regeneration is accomplished. Gail and Jeff, you are coming forward that these children may be baptized and thus enter according to order into the Lord's church on earth. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is written in the sacred scripture and in the heavenly doctrine of the New Jerusalem. And in those days, John the Baptist presented himself, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus, being baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And lo, a voice from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. See, lest you despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in the heavens continually look at the face of my Father who is in the heavens. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in the heavens that one of these little ones should perish. The uses of the two sacraments, baptism and Holy Supper, can be brought to light only by means of the spiritual sense, which is now disclosed for the new church for use in the worship of the Lord. The first use of baptism is introduction into the Christian church, and at the same time, insertion among Christians in the spiritual world, where everyone is inserted into societies and congregations according to the quality of the Christianity in him or outside of him. The second use of baptism is that the Christian may know and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and Savior, and follow him. The third use of baptism, which is the final use, is that man may be regenerated. Infants are introduced by baptism into the Christian heaven, and there, angels are assigned to them by the Lord to take care of them. Therefore, as soon as infants are baptized, angels are appointed over them, by whom they are kept in a state to receive faith in the Lord. But as they grow up and come into their own right and reason, these guardian angels leave them, and they draw into association with themselves such spirits as make one with their life and faith. From all this, it is clear that baptism is insertion among Christians in the spiritual world also. And finally, we read again from the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the consummation of the age. Amen. Would you please come forward now?
you are bringing these children into the presence of the Lord that they may be baptized with water, with the Holy Spirit, and with fire. By this act, you enter into a solemn covenant with the Lord. Now, therefore, let me ask, do you, for yourselves and for these children, believe that God is one, in whom is the divine trinity, and that the Lord God, the Savior, Jesus Christ, is that one? Do you for yourselves and for these children believe that evils should not be done because they are of the devil and from the devil and that goods should be done because they are of God and from God? Do. do you therefore wish these children to be baptized into the new church and thereby associated with the new Christian heaven? I do. Let us pray. O oh, most merciful Lord, help these children grow in the knowledge and strength of thy word. Send thine angels to protect them, that they re may remember that thou art always near, and that they may be kept from the evil way and learn to do what is good. Lead the parents of these children in the way of wisdom and love, so that in their guidance of them, they may prepare them for a life of use here on earth and forever in thy kingdom. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise. Now would you girls please kneel on the cushion there? Will you please state the name, Shay's name? Shay Pointer. Shay Lila Pointer. Thank you. Shay Lila, I baptize thee into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his face upon thee and give thee peace. And will you please state Lily's name? Lily Amelia. Lily Amelia, I baptize thee into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his face upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. You may be seated. By baptism, these children are now enrolled and numbered in heaven among those who in heart receive the Lord in his second coming. In the Lord's divine providence, they were born into the world, and they are entrusted to your care, so that by their life in the world, they may be prepared for life in heaven. And you are given the privilege of cooperating with the Lord to this end. Therefore, seek for the light and knowledge to guide you in the performance of your part in this work. Lead these children to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as their God and Father. Teach them the Lord's Prayer, that they may be introduced into the worship of the Lord. Teach them the Ten Commandments, so that they may learn to shun evils as sins. Instruct them in the Holy Scripture and in the heavenly doctrine of the New Jerusalem, that they may be prepared for regeneration. 
In this way, you will promote their happiness in this life and their eternal welfare in the world to come. May the Lord keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Baptism is a covenant, which means that people are making promises on two sides. The Lord is making a promise to us, and we are making a promise to Him. That way we come together, which is what a covenant means. Now, we are promising two things to the Lord. One is that we will believe in Him. We'll believe that He is the one God of heaven and earth. He created us. He protects us all the time, and He saves us from our sins. Without Him, we can't go to heaven. But with Him, we can go to heaven, and we can be happy and useful forever. And then the second thing is that we will keep His commandments. We will learn not to do the evil things that His commandments tell us not to do, and instead, then we can do good things that the Lord will give us to do. So those are the two things, that we will believe in the Lord and keep His commandments. That's what we're promising in baptism. Now, what does the Lord promise? The Lord promises that He will make us happier and happier forever. He will take care of us in this life, and He will make us happier and happier forever. The Lord promises that He will give us a special home in heaven that's a perfect house for us and a beautiful property to go with it. He says He will give us our, lead us to our proper husband and, or wife, with whom we will be happier and happier forever. The Lord will give us a wonderful job to do in heaven, something that we're really good at and that we love doing, and that we get to do it with a group of our closest friends. We get to do it for other people, and we see that it helps them. And that feeling of being able to help other people fills us up with the Lord's happiness. The Lord promises all of these things and so many more. If we will keep our part of the covenant, then He can keep His part of the covenant. Now, because it's a promise, a promise can be made at any time during our life. When a new baby is born, parents can make those promises for the little child. They can promise that they're going to teach the child growing up about the Lord and about keeping His commandments. Or we can be baptized as adults and make that promise for ourselves. Or even in older life, we can come to know the Lord and be baptized. And the thing about promises is they all depend on how well we keep them, don't they? So we know the Lord is going to keep His promise. That's what He wants more than anything else, is to make us happy, because He loves us more than we can imagine. And it only depends on how much we're willing to keep our side of the promise, our side of the covenant, because as much as we're willing to keep our side of the covenant, believing in the Lord and keeping His commandments, 
the more the Lord can fill us with His happiness. And if we, on the other hand, say no, I'm not going to believe in the Lord, I'm not going to keep His commandments, then even though the Lord still wants to keep His side, He can't because we're saying, stay away, I don't want to come to heaven. So that would be sad. But on the other hand, again, if we are keeping the Lord's commandments because the Lord says so, then the Lord promises that He will help us. He will help us learn the truths, just a few truths that we need, which are like spiritual water that we can take and apply to ourselves and say, hmm, what am I doing that's not following the Lord's commandments? We will recognize it and we'll be able to wash that away. Scrub and scrub and we get rid of those bad habits that are against our promise, that we're not keeping our promise. And the Lord will help us and we will be able to be saved from our sins, washed from our sins. And then the promise of baptism will come true for us. Just like at Jesus' baptism, heaven will be opened and the Lord's Holy Spirit will come down into us and we will know that the Lord is saying to us, you are my beloved child, my beloved son or child, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. May the Lord give his angels a command concerning you to keep you safe in all your ways. Amen.
hear further from the word of the Lord. First, in the very end of the Lord's sacred scripture, the end of the book of Revelation. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to render to each according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Happy are they who do his commandments, that their authority may be in the tree of life, and they may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and does a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. And he who desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and out of the things written in this book. He who testifies these things says, Yes, I come quickly. Amen. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We also read in the word of the Lord's second coming, the Apocalypse explained, number 22, explaining about the meaning of grace. Grace to you and peace signifies the delight of truth and good. This is evident from the signification of grace as being the delight of truth, about which more presently, and from the signification of peace as being the delight of the good of innocence and love. Grace means the delight of truth. To those in the spiritual kingdom, it is granted by the Lord to be in the affection of truth for the sake of truth. And this divine quality is what is called grace. So far, therefore, as anyone is in that affection, he is in the Lord's divine grace. And there is no other divine grace with man, spirit, or angel than to be affected by truth because it is truth. Since in that affection there is heaven and blessedness for them. Whether we say affection of truth or delight of truth, it is the same. For there is no affection without delight. This in particular is what is meant by grace in the word, as in John. And the word became flesh and dwelt in us. And we beheld his glory, a glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It is said, grace and truth, because grace is the affection and the delight of truth. In general, divine grace is all that is given from the Lord. And as all that is so given has relation to faith and love, and faith is the affection of truth from good, this faith is meant in particular by divine grace. For to be gifted with faith and love, or with the affection of truth from good, is to be gifted with heaven, thus with eternal blessedness. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.
Let the speech of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be for good pleasure in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This familiar benediction is the very last thing said in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Word. And at the very beginning of the Word, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God means the Lord's mercy. Nurturing remains of innocence, love, and charity in our dark states before regeneration. So at the beginning and at the ending of the word, we see the Lord's mercy and grace, like the two hands of our Father safely holding his children. The Lord's love and mercy are the origin of creation. They are the reason why every little child, each one of us, is born into this world. And the grace of being with him in heaven is the end to which he is leading us. Baptism represents the promise of the Lord's merciful blessing and the way of truth by which he brings us from the beginning of life to the end in heaven and onward to increasingly happy states to eternity. What in particular is meant by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? In the literal sense, grace has two meanings. It means beauty or charm, and it also means goodwill and mercy, as when one person extends grace towards another. In the first sense, grace is a seemingly effortless beauty of movement, form, or proportion. We might think of a ballerina or beautiful architecture. Grace can also be applied to skill in avoiding an inept or clumsy course of action, such as in the way one deals with another. Such grace of form and action corresponds to truth from good, that is, to having a perception of what is orderly and right, married to a love of doing what is orderly and right. Joseph in Egypt is a good example for he found grace in the eyes of Potiphar because of his wise management of Potiphar's affairs. Concerning the Lord himself, we read, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In the lesson, we read that grace signifies being delighted with truth. Grace is the feeling of joy one has at the discovery or recognition of a truth which is so evidently and beautifully true that it is delightful. <clears throat> to those who are in the spiritual kingdom, we read, it is granted by the Lord to be in the affection of truth for the sake of truth. And this divine gift is what is called grace. So far as anyone is in this affection, he is in the Lord's divine grace and there is no other divine grace given with a man, spirit, or angel than the grace of being affected with truth because it is true. There is no other grace since in that affection they have heaven and all its blessedness. The affection of truth is gracefulness itself. When a person loves the truth, not for the sake of personal advantage, reputation, honor, and gain, but simply because it is true and leads to a useful life, then he learns how to act wisely. And to act wisely is the essence of grace. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Grace, the love of truth, and glory, enlightenment accordingly. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The second meaning of grace is goodwill. Grace is a disposition to be generous or helpful and to grant favors, as when someone helps another with a good grace. 
To be in someone's good graces is to have their favor. Grace has the sense of kindness, which bestows on someone something beyond what he has earned. It is often said of a master toward a servant. The angel Gabriel said, Fear not, Mary, for you have found grace with God. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. In the Old Testament especially, the Lord's grace is his mercy toward mankind, his willingness to forgive our sins. We read, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. We often find grace and mercy mentioned together. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and of great mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. The heavenly doctrine explains the difference between mercy and grace. It has to do with the different ways people receive the Lord's mercy. Those who are celestial acknowledge that we human beings are utterly unclean, excrementitious and hellish. So they plead for the Lord's mercy. From the Lord they know our frame. They remember that we are dust, utterly damned apart from the Lord's mercy. The spiritual know that this is true, but they do not really perceive and acknowledge it in their hearts. They love themselves in their proprial sense of self-worth. They imagine that they can do good of themselves and so earn or deserve salvation. And to that extent, they find it difficult to sincerely plead for the Lord's mercy, except in times of temptation. Instead, they ask for His grace his indulgence with some things they've done wrong, and the favor of admission to his kingdom. Now the Lord is infinitely merciful, gracious, and forgiving. He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It is only a question of how much of his love and mercy we will receive. He will remove as many evils as we are willing to acknowledge and truly want him to take away from us. This is what the Lord's grace is like. So when we truly receive his grace, he leads us to forgive others, following his example. The very word charity comes from the Greek word for grace. The whole word teaches love to the Lord and charity toward the neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When we receive the Lord's grace in the affection of truth, His truth teaches us to love and forgive our neighbors. And so far as we act in this spirit of His grace, we receive His grace, and we are forgiven for our sins. We cease to cling to evils. We learn by experience that only the Lord is good, and that all our blessings are sheerly by His gracious kindness not by our having earned them. These teachings apply to baptism and the parent's role. Parents can help their children learn to act gracefully and to receive the Lord's grace. They can set an example to their children of walking uprightly, acting with justice, and speaking the truth in their hearts as well as with their lips. Example is the most powerful way for parents to help their children grow in wisdom as well as in stature and in grace with God and man. In particular, parents need to study, reflect, and work to act with gracious, loving kindness toward their children in the image of our Heavenly Father. Often, various kinds of punishment are necessary since all children are born with inclinations to evils. The fact that they, as we, have these inclinations is not at all the children's fault. 
we should know that they are going to do and say ungraceful, disorderly things just as we do. Parents then have the opportunity and the duty to help their children. They can teach them what is appropriate and orderly, help them learn to restrain these inclinations before they become the children's own habit and nature. In meeting out punishment where necessary, an evil spirit of revenge often creeps in, clouding one's judgment of what is fair and one's perception of a child's state. Punishment is necessary, but we must try to let the spirit of the Lord's grace guide us. This requires regular self-examination and repentance. It also takes a lot of thought and mutual discussion between husband and wife as to what is the wisest, most prudent, and loving way to train a child. Another important parental use is to teach the children the stories and teachings of the Word with as much affection as possible. Grace is the affection of truth. There is no substitute for regular family worship or regularly reading the Word with our children and saying the prayer. This is the best way to stir an affection for the Word. New church schools can be a wonderful supplement, but a child's most respected and loved adults, the closest image of the Lord to him or her, are parents and grandparents. The parents' own love of the stories of the Word, their commitment to finding time for worship, and the attention they focus on their children to help them learn these stories and their meanings, go far deeper than what a school can provide. As a boy grows up, his parents can help him grow into a masculine love of knowing things, understanding, and becoming wise, masculine grace. They can help him learn to respect and honor the beauty and grace with which the Lord has created women. A girl's parents can help her grow into a love of knowledge, intelligence, and wisdom, especially as it is with men, and to love being graceful and beautiful as the Lord has created her, not for her own sake, but for others. In the promise of conjugal love more than anywhere else, we see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, for all of his blessings are gathered together into love truly conjugal. The Lord came into the world to save us from our sins. He gave us the chance to choose whether we will receive his mercy and grace. The Lord also revived the nearly extinct affection of truth with mankind. He resuscitated the knowledge of truth by fulfilling the Word Himself in person and by teaching with authority and with perfect accommodation to our states. The Lord made it possible for us to find delight in the truth again, especially now that we see that He Himself is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, full of grace and truth. And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The sacrament of baptism, the sign of entrance into the Christian church, is full of a wonderful promise that we may come to know and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as our Redeemer and Savior and follow Him, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ may be with us all. Amen. Now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, say la. See, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I have chosen to stand at the threshold in the house of my God, rather than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For thou, O Lord God, art a sun and shield. Thou wilt give grace and glory. No good thing wilt thou withhold from them who walk in integrity. O Lord of hosts, happy is the man who trusts in thee. Amen. Yes, I come quickly. Amen. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.